Hello everyone, thank you for joining me for part 3 of this video series entitled What Code Officials Need to Know About HVAC System Design. The two previous videos covered load calculations and equipment selection, and this third one will cover duct system design. My name is Luis Escobar and I am the manager of codes and standards here at ACCA, the Indoor Environment and Energy Efficiency Association. Let's get started. In case you haven't seen the previous two videos, here's a little information about ACCA. We've been around since 19, uh, 1914 and adopted the name Air Conditioning Contractors of America in 1969. Our mission is to lead America's indoor environment and energy professionals to business success by representing the community with an emphasis on legislative, technical, and regulatory issues. We also provide training and certifications for the design of comfortable, safe, and energy efficient systems. Now a little bit about me. I'm a mechanical engineer that's been with ACCA since 2011. I'm the staff lead on ACCA's standards development, <clears throat> maintenance, and revision work, and I also manage our activities in the realm of building codes. Finally, I serve on various committees within the industry um, with organizations like ICC, NFPA, IATMO, ASHRAE, and ANSI. As a reminder, we have two goals for this video series. First, we want the viewer to understand the basic steps of what it takes to do an accurate residential HVAC system design by the time you finish the last video. Second, we want to prepare you so that you can conduct an effective and efficient plan review for the purpose of issuing a permit. But remember that this is not a design course. We do have those available for you, but this is not one. Uh, think of this video series as a high-level view of, for someone that needs to understand the design process but doesn't actually work as a designer. And like the other parts of the series, this presentation was developed with, uh, with the assumptions that the viewer is, not, uh, is pretty new to plans review, has never worked as a designer of residential HVAC systems, and isn't prone to reading up on system design on their own. Um, and if these assumptions are not true of you, then you may find that this presentation is too basic and may be better served by our other design courses. Um, please visit ACCA to see our other offerings or skip back to the end of this video where I talk about those. As a reminder, this video series was adapted from an in-person presentation, um, but we've split it into three video segments so that it's easier to digest. In this video, We'll first discuss the designer's objective, uh, then we'll move on to the basic components of duct system design, I'll provide some recommended verification points and, and then caveats like I did for the previous videos, and we'll finish with the design review form and other ACCA resources that we've made available for you. So let's begin with the designer's objective. Ideally, what, we, what they want to do is design a mechanical system that can add or remove heat at a rate that allows the interior of a home to achieve their desired design conditions, and that'll help keep the occupants uh, comfortable and safe. Now, this diagram presents the full ACCA system design process. The blue boxes show what the steps are, and in the middle you'll find the corresponding residential ACCA manuals with the corresponding commercial manuals farther to the right. For this introductory video series, we're focusing on one, the load calculation, which was the first video, two, equipment selection, which was the previous video, and three, duct sizing, which is this third and final video. These are the core steps for a proper HVAC um, system design, and not surprisingly, they're also the minimum code requirements. If you'd like more information on the other aspects that go into a great system design, such as zoning, adjusting, testing, and balancing, uh, check out our website for additional training. This presentation, however, will focus on Manual D, which covers duct sizing. Let's get started with what we already know. Before getting to the duct sizing portion, the designer will have already done a load calculation for the home as per Manual J, and then selected the equipment to be installed in accordance with the requirements of the total capacity for total capacity per Manual S. And if you remember, um, we want to make sure that we got the blower information, uh, performance information from the equipment selection portion of the design. 
Um, this comes from blower tables, which show the output capacity in CFM, which are uh, cubic feet per, min uh, per minute, in relation to the external static pressure, um, otherwise known as ESP, um, produced at that output. And this all comes down to the fundamental driver for the sizing of the ducts, which is that the pressure drop causing resistance to the airflow will have to match the external static pressure that's produced by the blower for the design CFM. Now, this airflow resistance causing pressure drop will be the sum of the uh, pressure drop due to the duct runs, the fittings, and any uh, um, air side components. We'll talk a little bit more about this later. But what it really all comes down to is the equation that you see down here, which is called the friction rate equation. So let's look at this a little bit more in detail. As you can see here, the friction rate has four parts. On the left side of the equation is FR, the friction rate, um, which has units of inches of water column per 100. So that's where you see the IWC slash 100. Um, that's what we're solving for in order to be able to size the ducts, and this will be constant for the entire system, the FR. <clears throat> on the right side, on the top, we see the pressure drop, PD, which is uh, multiplied by the constant 100. Now, this PD can also be called the available static pressure, and it's equal to the external static pressure, or ESP, produced by the blower minus the component pressure losses. Um, these component pressure losses are the losses that you get from the grills, from the filters, from the coil, and other airside components. So really, we could write another equation to take the place of PD that we see here in this uh, friction rate equation, um, and that would be ASP, that's the available static pressure, is equal to ESP, external static pressure produced by the blower, minus CPL, or component pressure losses. We'll keep the equation how it is for now to keep it simple, but keep that in mind. Now, at the bottom of the equation, uh, we see the final part of the equation, which is uh, the total effective length, or TEL, of the longest path in the duct system. Um, all this is is the sum of the length of all the straight duct runs plus the effective length of each individual fitting for the longest identified path in the system. Um, so that's from the farthest return grill to the farthest supply register. Now, when we talk about effective lengths of a fitting, what we're saying is that for every duct contraction or turn, maybe there's like a 90 degree turn, um, uh, you see that uh, there's, we know that there's been testing that's been done to provide the length of a piece of straight duct that produces the same amount of pressure uh, drop. And so that's why we call it the same effective length. Um, please keep in mind that the total effective length only applies to the longest path in the duct system, okay? So the next, next step in sizing the ducts is to find out how many CFMs are, of air are needed um, by each room. And this is done by using the equation at the top of this slide. Now to get this equation, we start with a simple assumption and then go to, to uh, then do a little bit of simple algebra. So first we assume that if a room's load is a certain percentage of the total cooling load, um, say 15%, then the room CFM requirement should also be 15% of the total CFM produced by the blower. Um, well, that gives us the relationship of room load over total load is equal to room CFM over total CFM. To get this equation uh, for room CFM, we simply multiply the other side of the equation by the total CFM. And that's how we get the equation that you see here, which states that an individual room CFM is equal to the room's load times the total blower CFM divided by the total load. Now, each room will have two room CFMs, one for heating and one for cooling, and the designer is required to go with the bigger of the two. And we do this because if the ducts can handle the bigger air requirement, then it shouldn't have an issue dealing with the lower CFM requirement. Now, let's check out an example so we can see how these equations really work. All right, say we have a system that has a blower CFM of 1,000, um, a heating load of 60,000 BTUH, and a cooling load of 48,000 BTUH, which we see at the top of this table. Now, in the table, we have three rooms that we see all the way to the far left, um, and the, the loads for heating and cooling have also been filled out. 
Let's make sure they're correct though. If we add the first column of numbers, we have 4,800 plus 19,200 plus 24,000 BTUH equals 48 BTUH, which correctly matches the total cooling load stated above. The next column over has the individual heating loads for each room, and adding them up, we can verify that they add up to 60,000 BTUH mentioned at the top of the at the top of the table. So now we know that the total uh, so now we know the total blower CFM, which was given to us, um, the total loads for cooling and heating, and the individual uh, room's load contribution for heating and cooling. Now, using the equation that we saw on the previous slide, that is, room CFM is equal to total CFM times the room load divided by total load, um, we can get the room's required CFM for both cooling and heating seasons, and if uh, which have now been filled out in these columns, it's um, CCFM for cooling CFM and HCFM for heating CFM. Um, if we look at the last column to the right, we see that each room's design CFM was chosen because it was the bigger of its cooling or heating CFM requirements. Now keep in mind that some rooms design CFM will be the cooling CFM while others design CFM will be the heating CFM and there's nothing wrong with that. Remember we want the size for the bigger requirement. Okay, so now we know the friction. Uh, we know the friction rate, which is equal to the um, available static pressure times 100 divided by the total effective length, and we also know how to calculate the room's design CFM. So let's look at an example design. Here we see a pretty basic duct system design. We see that on the left there are two return runs. That's R1 and R2. And on the right, we see three supply runs, S1, S2, and S3. Uh, the diagram tells us that the blower produces 1,000 CFM at 0 0.60 inches of water column. Um, so that's the ESP, the external static pressure. Each supply in return has its associated total equivalent length and the room CFM, uh, which, is worked out, which was worked out the same way that we did in the previous slide. <clears throat> Now remember that the total equivalent length is the sum of the length of the straight parts and any fittings to get to that individual supply register or return grill. Now, uh, quickly we can check that the CFM on the return side, R1 plus R2, is equal to blower CFM. Also, we can see that the CFM on the supply side, S1 plus S2 plus S3, also is equal to 1000 CFM, which is the blower CFM, so we're all clear on that. Now, let's just find the longest path from the furthest return grill to the furthest supply grill. On this simple design, it's pretty obvious that that's the path from S3, supply 3, to R2, return 2. So we add their total equivalent lengths together to get the combined total equivalent length of 480 feet for the longest path in this system. Here, I should point out that in some complex systems, the farthest runs aren't always the longest TEL paths, the total equivalent length or effective lengths. For example, if for some reason the path to one supply register has a lot of turns or fittings, its total effective length may be much bigger than the total effective length of a further register that's simply at the end of a straight duct run. So now let's look at some additional info that's not seen in the diagram. We'll assign values for the component pressure losses. Um, in this case, there's three types. The first is the pressure loss for the coil, which we'll say is uh, 0.08 inches per water of water column. Um, then there's a pressure loss from the registers, which we'll say is 0 0.03 inches of water column. And we'll say the same for pressure losses from the turn grills. So the total component pressure loss is 0 0.08 plus 0 0.03 plus 0 0.03, which is equal to 0 0.14. Now, I should mention that a designer will actually have very specific uh, numbers for this, depending on what is actually in the system, and they should go with that. So each register uh, will have been tested, and they'll have a component pressure loss associated with it. Each uh, Same for each grill, for each coil. Every aspect of their design should actually reflect the physical properties of the system. Now, remember the uh, friction rate equation? Um, that is, the friction rate equals the available static pressure times 100 divided by the total effective length of the longest run. Well, the last thing that we need to do this calculation 
um, is to calculate the available static pressure, which is simply the blower's ESP, the external static pressure, minus the component pressure losses. So the available static pressure, ASP, is equal to 0 0.60, which we've been given, that's the blower ESP, um, minus 0 0.14, which we just calculated. So that equals out to 0 0.46 of inches, inches of water column. That's our available static pressure. Now, if we plug that and the TL that we originally had of uh, 480 feet into the friction rate, it gives us a total friction rate of 0 0.096. Okay, so what do we do with this now? Well, first we need to make sure that the friction rate we just got fits into the friction rate wedge. On this graph, we see that the x-axis represents the available static pressure. The y-axis represents the total effective length. The diagonal lines you see are simple representations for different values of the friction rate if you plotted it out. Since we calculated the friction rate of 0 0.096, we can see that this graph, uh, from this graph that it does in fact fall within the desired wedge, so we're good. If it hadn't, then we would run into air velocity. Uh, you can see from the graph that above the wedge, um, we'd have a fan that's too weak, and below the wedge uh, would mean that our fan is way too powerful for our needs. So let's go back to the diagram we were looking at earlier. Here's, uh, we'll do, here we'll do the math for the sizing each part of the duct system. Now, remember that we know the total effective length, effective length uh, to every register and grill, um, as well as the associated room CFM. Well, we actually know a little bit more. Like, we see that the room CFM for supply one is 100 CFM, and we know that the blower is producing 1,000 CFM. So the trunk from the blower to the runout to supply one um, is moving 1,000 CFM, but the next segment of the trunk between S1, supply 1, and S2 now carries only 1,000 minus 100, or which equals to 900 CFM, and that's because you subtract that 100 CFM that are being sent out to supply 1. And, okay, well, that, that means that the section between uh, of, uh, of trunk um, between S2 and S3 is accommodating 900 minus 400 CFM um, since 400 CFM is being delivered at S2. In other words, 500 CFM to the final supply. And that makes sense. Also remember that the friction rate for the entire duct system is constant, and for this one is 0 0.096 inches of water column. So now we just need to get a duct slide rule. On the right, you see a picture of the active duct slide rule. Um, using the known friction rate and room CFMs, we can adjust the slide rule to give us the appropriate duct size for each segment. Um, and the slide rule will actually also give us the associated air velocity in feet per minute, which will come in handy in a bit. So why do we need this velocity, you may ask? Well, it's because there are limits to how high the velocity can go. The reason for the limits is that too high an air velocity in the ducts can lead to turbulence within the ducts and also noise issues. I'm sure you uh, you may have been in a room at some point in your life that was extremely that had extremely extremely loud ducts um, that caused disturbance. Actually, the last time that I was in that situation happened to be at a work conference, and it was so bad that I had to leave the meeting because there was no way to hear anything that was being said at the other side of the room. So, if a consumer is paying to be comfortable. Um, temperature-wise in their home, it stands to reason that they would also want to be able to hear their TV or their guests, and so so making sure that we're staying within the velocity limits is important. So what do you do if the, the velocity given by the slide rule for a particular combination of friction rate and room CFM exceeds the limits set by manual D? Well, then you just use the room CFM combined with the max allowable velocity that you have from this table as your sizing metrics. Um, the table on the slide rule on the slide actually also uh, gives you the velocity limits for trunk and branch ducts and that's um, be they made of uh, rigid or flexible material. Uh, and that rounds out the basics of what it takes to do the sizing of the air distribution system. 
Of course, the designer will need to do many calculations to make sure that every length of duct is sized correctly, and they'll need to make sure that they account for all the fittings and other details. But that was just an overview so you understand what they should be doing. So that brings us to the next part of this presentation, um, which are the ACA recommended verification points for duct sizing. Well, um, we've come up with six essential points that are pretty easy to verify. The first one is the design airflow for the blower. Um, and then there's the associated external pressure at that airflow. And these are pretty easy to verify from the blower table. Then there are the component pressure losses. That's the sum of all the losses caused by the coil, the filters, the grills, the registers, etc. Next is a quick arithmetic check. Um, to, to make sure that the available static pressure is in fact equal to the external static pressure minus the component pressure losses. Um, you should also verify the total effective length used in the friction rate equation for the longest path from the farthest return to the farthest supply. And finally, do a quick check to make sure that the friction rate falls within the wedge and was calculated correctly. But like for the load calculation and equipment selection portions, you also need to watch out for a couple of things in the duct sizing portion of the HVAC system design. The first thing is to watch out for designers that use a rule of thumb. The one that we see the most often is to assume that the friction rate is always 0 0.10. And that's not always the case. If one designer always seems to have the same friction rate, um, go in to make sure that they're actually doing the calculations based on the physical system and not just cutting corners and using the same one. Um, the second thing to watch out for is that they didn't make a simple arith arithmetic mistake. It happens, but um, for uh, duct sizing, it should be really easy to catch because they're simple equations. And remember that it doesn't matter if the designer did a thorough load calculation and then followed the proper procedures for selecting the equipment. If they don't size the ducts correctly, it could be all for nothing since, uh, since they may not be able to get the conditioned air to where it needs to be or may leave the homeowner with serious noise problems. So it's really important to make sure that you check and especially, I have to stress, make sure that they don't use a default friction rate. It should be dependent on the actual system that they have. All right, now, we've talked about the steps that the designer should be following for properly sizing the ducts, and I've just shared with you the ACCA recommended minimum verification points, as well as some caveats when reviewing the air distribution system design. Now let's talk about the resources we have available for you. The major one is the ACCA design review form. On this one simple form, you have all the information that needs to be checked for the load calculation, the equipment selection, and the duct sizing procedures for residential mechanical system design. We make it available to you for free as a download on our codes page, which you can see at the bottom of this slide. Just go to acca.org slash standards slash codes to download your own copy. Many jurisdictions have actually incorporated it in their plans review process because it standardizes the review procedures and cuts down on the amount of paperwork submitted for each permit request. It's also customizable so your jurisdiction can add your logo at the top right corner. In red, you see that I've highlighted the duct sizing portion, so let's look at this a little more closely. As you can see, it has a place for the six verification points that we recommended to you a little bit ago. That is, uh, you can ask for the design airflow, the external static pressure, and then the sum of the component losses, the available static pressure, and the total effective length of the longest system path, and obviously the calculated friction rate. The designer actually can also specify the duct material used. Now, I want to stress that this form is available to you for free. Just visit ACCA's codes page. Again, you see the link. It's acca.org slash standards slash codes. So please take advantage of this free resource that we have for you. <clears throat> Let's see what other resources we have. Another one that we have uh, that we've developed specifically for code officials is a booklet uh, called Bob's House. Essentially what it is is a case study that walks you through all the steps of a residential HVAC system design. So you'll see one example for a model home from the beginning to the end, from the load calculation to the uh, system, uh, the 
equipment selection to the duct sizing. And this booklet is available for you to purchase at the ACCA online store, which you see there. Now, for those wishing to go deeper and get a better understanding of the design process, ACCA also offers various design courses. The introductory one is Design for Quality Installation, which can be taken as a three-day in-person course here at our offices in Arlington, Virginia, or as an online certificate program that takes about 22 to 25 hours to complete. Um, and this one is comprised of 28 videos on demand and can be taken at your own pace. You can do it after work, during work, whenever you want, on the weekends if, if that's your thing. Now, um, those that are already have a solid understanding of mechanical system design can take our educational program in instructor certification or EPIC course um, to become an instructor of HVAC system design. Now, this course is an intensive four-day course also held here in our offices in Arlington, and to be certified, you have to pass a test, which is pretty rigorous. And then we also always want to encourage anyone that can make it to attend our technical sessions at our annual conference each year. Check out ACCA.org for details on this year's conference. Now, thank you everyone for joining me on this video covering the duct sizing aspect of residential HVAC system design. This concludes the introductory, this introductory video series for code officials. Um, please feel free to take advantage of the other technical materials that we have available for you in the members portion of the ACCA website. And please don't hesitate to contact me directly if you have any questions uh, or concerns regarding system design. Thank you very much. This has been Luis Escobar. Have a good day.